Welcome to another episode of Mad Talk. We bring various experts to discuss current and important topics to benefit our audience. This is our 10th episode during current public health crisis and pandemic with COVID-19. As we are trying to ease up the restrictions and open up the economy, many questions are still unanswered and there are a lot of confusion and uncertainty and panic and fear and some speculations about second wave and concerns to many Americans. There will be new normal post COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of questions regarding how to safely open the economy and go back to work or business in a new normal. We have a very special guest, Dr. Robert G. Lahida with us today. Let me give you a brief introduction of him. Dr. Robert Lahita is a chairman of medicine at the St. Joseph Healthcare System and academic chair at both the Patterson and Wayne locations in New Jersey. He is also professor of medicine at New York Medical College and clinical professor at Rutgers, the New Jersey Medical School. Dr. Lahita is the author or editor of 14 books and 140 scientific peer-reviewed papers. He is currently working on the sixth edition of his textbook as the senior editor. He is also preparing a trade book, The Biological Soul, which describes the remarkable aspects of the immune system and its functions in the human body. He is currently on the editorial boards of several medical journals, among them the journal Lupus, where he is associate editor. Dr. Lahita is a master of the American College of Rheumatology, fellow of the American College of Physicians, and fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. He also has an honorary doctor of humane letters from St. Peter's University. Dr. Lahita's research in Interests include gender and sex as applied to the immune system and the ideology of cytokine storm and antiphospholipid syndrome. Dr. Lahita provides his expertise via interviews with CBS, NBC, and many other major reputed television networks. Dr. Lahita, welcome to Mad Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Lahita, thank you for your time to come to Mad Talk. Uh, give some education uh, and understanding about current situation with COVID-19. This is the pandemic of the century. So can you tell us, Dr. Lahita, Dr. Lahita, where do we go from here? What is happening right now in New Jersey and across the country? Well, we are technically still in what we call phase one. <clears throat> and phase one means that we're still with the initial force of the virus. We're not having a resurgence of the virus. It's simply that the metropolitan area of New York seems to be somewhat quiescent now. It has calmed down. The number of cases have plateaued, and now they're going and trending to zero. The question is, of course, why that is happening, since in Texas, Florida, and Arizona, the cases are going up. Now, you could attribute that to mitigation, which means mitigation is wearing a mask, and washing your hands with frequency and keeping six feet social distance from other people. We did that assiduously here in the Northeast. And as you know, New York City, and we are, my hospital, St. Joseph's University Hospital is in the penumbra, as the governor of New York said, of New York City. We're very close. So we suffered tremendous numbers of patients and tremendous numbers of deaths. The whole area in the Northeast had hundreds of thousands of victims. And each state, New York and New Jersey, suffered multiple, multiple thousands of deaths. That mitigation process was very effective if we believe that the virus was controlled by that. Initially, we couldn't mitigate, we had to suppress the virus. By that, I meant we had to do everything in our power with drugs that we didn't know if they worked. And we still don't have a drug that is 100% successful. Correct. So we did our best, we mitigated, we, we used tremendous amounts of personal protection equipment, and we really were quarantined and stayed at home. We closed all of our businesses, and that worked. It appears to have worked. But in the South, that's not the case. The governor of Georgia, the governor of Florida, the governor of Texas and Arizona, and perhaps some other states have released 
the mitigation process. And consequently, you have these spikes because you see young people in swimming pool parties, at hotel parties, in bars. Um, I was talking about this this morning about millennials, uh, young people who feel that they are invincible and they don't wear masks and they don't wash their hands and they exchange drinks with their friends, drinking out of the same bottle of beer, for example, sharing a cup of coffee with a friend, maybe even a cigarette. That's not what you want to do. The deal is to treat, as I've said multiple times, and Dr. Fauci has said the same thing, to treat everybody as though they're a potential infection and behave as though the person you're talking to and cavorting with is infected. If you do that, you'll control the infection totally. But that's not happening right now in some of those states in the okay. South. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Lahida, you are telling that uh, we are doing better in uh, New York and New Jersey. But if the things are not good in about approximately 50 to 20 other states, would that impact our area as well in a few weeks? People can bring the virus back and we can have a res resurgence of uh, virus again? That's the concern of the governors of New Jersey and of New York. The concern is that people will fly from Miami, they'll fly from uh, Austin and Dallas and Houston and come back to the New York area vis-a-vis -vis -vis the airports and, and then reinfect us all. And that is not a resurgence, that's the same infection, but it's being revisited. Revisited. And uh, we've lost a lot of people. We've lost thousands and thousands of people and I don't wanna see us lose another several thousand people. And, our intensive care unit was overworked. We had to set up three or four new intensive care units to accommodate the load. We had to call in more ventilators to be able to intubate patients in large numbers. I don't wanna see that again because that was really terrible. And that's what could happen if this infection is not controlled in the Southern states. Now, you know that you know the difference is that the, the governors have been given the option of opening or closing the states. Okay. The governor of California today, because of a resurgence of cases, decided that he mandates people wearing masks at everything. In New Jersey, we're mandating that people wear masks. I'm in my office here. I have my wife and I have, uh, you know, no fear that we're being infected, but I wear my mask as soon as I get in the car. And I, wherever I go, even the gas station, I wear a mask. Yes, so so very good point, uh, Dr. Lahita, that uh, people st still need to follow the guidelines given by the state and the CDC of, of face coverings or, or wearing the mask, right. covering your cough, covering your mouth, uh, yeah. using the uh, sanitizers, washing your hands, all, all those uh, mitigating factors to ensure that we reduce the spread. So uh, the, the pandemic is still going on in uh, and, and there is there is no doubt about that the pandemic is over. Right. The pandemic is not over. Pandemic's not over. It will go on and on. And you, you see it uh, in Brazil, in the Southern Hemisphere now, the Latin American countries, uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica, where the healthcare is suboptimal. We've been lucky in the United States. We have, we have a tremendous technology here. We have the ability to handle ICU cases, although I'm told in Atlanta, the ICU beds are, they're running out of beds. I was told uh, today that in Florida, they're running out of ICU beds because these beds fill up very quickly. One of the terrible signs and symptoms of this condition is a shortness of breath and a dropping of what's called the pulse oxygenation. Yes. The pulse oxygenation goes below a certain level, we'll say 85. You become quite short of breath and if it's slow, you really become short of breath and you can lose consciousness and indeed you could die if you don't have intubation and a respirator, a, va a ventilator. So that's happening now in the South. And uh, it has happened in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, in, in Latin American countries like Mexico and Brazil where the, the ability to get patients and put them in intensive care settings is not good. It's suboptimal. I know in Brazil it is, and I know in Mexico it is, and in Central America, I'm told the same thing. But in our country, because of the rush of mutations in these southern states, they're having a tough time keeping up with the infected people, the infections. So I'm, I'm very fearful that we're going to see another spike in the Northeast soon. 
So what is, what is your advice, Dr. Lahita? What should be the states of New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and surrounding states do now, next few months, as the summer is approaching, uh, warm weather, people will start going to the beach, start having social gatherings, uh, backyard parties and pool parties. What is your advice to our audience? What, what should they do to protect themselves? Well, if they're having backyard parties, keep six feet away from the person in your party. I wouldn't advise you to have a party for more than 10 people. And they should be six feet apart from each other, spaced apart. Wear a mask, and if you're serving food, wear gloves, rubber gloves, disposable gloves. Most restaurants now in the state of New Jersey will allow outdoor seating with tables of no more than eight people and the tables have to be six feet apart. There's no buffet allowed. The waiter has to wear a mask. Everyone in the restaurant or outside has to wear a mask and the waiter has to continue to wash his hands with frequency when he's serving the food. So this is very, very important. This is the rules and regs for, for the restaurants. Next Monday, the governor has decided to open up salons and barber shops and that will be a major uh, turning point. But even the barber shops, and I must say that all of us need haircuts, the barber shop will be consisting of a barber with uh, a face shield, uh, a, a mask, and probably wearing gloves because he has people in his chair, his barber chair, he doesn't know whether they're infected or not infected. And you can be infectious even though you're asymptomatic for a few days. And that's the big worry we have because, and you know, in my business of medicine, I see doctors all the time who come down with COVID-19 and I had remembered being with them a few days earlier. So I'm always on edge worrying, well, maybe I slipped up, you know, maybe they talked to me and they were too close, et cetera. So it's very worrisome. It's very, very um, chancy. It's just something that I would prefer we'd go away yes. so we wouldn't have to deal with this anymore. Yes. So very interesting question I have, Dr. Lahita, regarding the testing. Testing has been a, a challenge uh, for for last few months in this country. Yeah. Uh, where do we stand right now in, in getting the testing, antigen testing as well as the antibody testing? Uh, do, did we make any progress? What are the numbers right now? Where do we need to be now uh, for the yeah. testing? Well, the testing is widely available. There are still public areas. Uh, I know here in our area at William Patterson College, the roads are closed. You can drive in and get tested for free. Uh, you can get tested here in Paramus, uh, around my area here, around St. Joe's area. There are free testing locations. My office where I see patients, I can draw blood and send for the antibody test. <clears throat> I prefer not to send for the antigen test now, for your viewers, let's, make, let's explain the difference. The antigen is the actual virus itself. And the way the test is done is a, a cannula is placed into the nose and pushed all the way back to what's called the nasopharynx, which is where the virus enters. It, and it cultivates and multiplies there. And you scrape the nasopharynx, pull it out, put it in some media, and send it off. And the virus is tested for via something called a PCR. It stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's very, very specific. It uses the nucleic acid inside the virus and it measures that and it's boom. That's, if that's positive, you have COVID-19. Now the reason for the antigen being specific is that there are many, many coronaviruses. Some coronaviruses cause the common cold. And so you can cross react with those coronaviruses that we all have because we, some of us get two, three colds a year, and that's usually either a rhinovirus, Coxsackie virus, coronavirus, adenovirus, but the coronavirus is extremely common. So there's cross reactivity. The tests that are now widely available are very specific for COVID-19, and that's very important. So we can do several hundred samples a day and have the results in two hours. Before, back in March, we used to take 14 days to get one test back and it was horrible because we had to send it to the state health department and then they would have thousands and thousands of tests coming in so we've come a long way in three months we are prepared to do extensive testing going forward for the antigen 
Now let's go to the antibody. The antibody is a protein that's produced by plasma cells. And the plasma cells are descended from B lymphocytes. Those are cells that circulate around a part of your immune system. And these antibodies are proteins that are very specific. The immune system is remarkable in that it has memory. It recognizes things that it's familiar with. In the case of COVID-19, it's never seen that before. So it's not familiar with that. So copious amounts of antibody are secreted that are specific antibodies directed to the spike proteins, the spike proteins on the surface of the virus. That's a protein that's very specific to COVID-19. The antibodies are made to that. And now we can test for not only IgG, which indicates that you were infected a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago, or IgM at Mamas and Mary, that means that you've just been infected. And then there's a third antibody called an IgA, A as in Albert. That antibody is usually associated with infection of the bowel. And a lot of people with COVID don't have respiratory, but rather have GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Yes. I've seen a couple of those, and uh, they are, that's pretty nasty. So the basic thing is you're trying to test the patients to see if they were infected, and the antibody IgG, which is the one that's widely available, even in our hospital, we have IgG testing going on, um, is, is very specific and it is FDA approved, and it's also CDC approved. Now the IgA and the IgM are also available from the commercial labs, but I'm not so sure about the specifics of that. The specificity is somewhat disconcerting. I know at the hospital, we don't offer IgM and IgA. So I hope that's explained somewhat clearly what these antibodies are. All viruses cause the formation of neutralizing antibodies. The antibody neutralizes the virus by attacking the virus and removing it. Very well explained. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lohita. So you talked about the testing. Can you shed some light on what's happening with the treatment, acute treatment for the COVID-19 cases? Do we have any right now? <clears throat> yes, that's a good question. The treatment basically right now is very limited. We are putting everyone that comes in on remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug that's widely available. It doesn't work for everybody. It works for some patients, and we usually reserve remdesivir for those critically ill patients. It can reverse the process. But what kills most of the patients is the immune system. And you saw a study come out of England yesterday about dexamethasone, which is a steroid, a glucocorticoid like cortisone or prednisone that is used, it's very strong. It is used to treat patients who are getting sicker and sicker. And we have been using corticosteroids now for the past two and a half months. So this is not news. But what is news is it's the first time they've done a study. So dexamethasone is something that we can give, which can reverse the immune system's overactivity. What most of the patients die from is not from the virus, but they die from the immune systems that's hacking the body. And that's very important to understand. So we have dexamethasone and we have remdesivir. Hydroxychloroquine is useless in the hospitalized patient and Zithromax is useless. Now, I want to be fair about those drugs because you've heard a lot about them. The problem with these drugs is that they're widely available for patients with arthritis like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. I use them routinely. But there seems to be a mini shortage now of these drugs or Plaquenil, which is hydroxychloroquine, okay. because there's so many people using it for COVID. What I would try, and there's nothing wrong with doing this, is in the early stages of the infection, trying this immunosuppressive called hydroxychloroquine. As you know, President Trump was on it for two weeks. And a lot of people, a lot of patients take it when they feel the symptoms coming on. No harm in doing that because the drug is, for all intents, pretty safe. But it has its downside when it's combined with Zithromax or the z -pack, as everybody knows it, because it changes the electrocardiogram so that you open yourself up to having irregularities of the heartbeat. And you can have an arrhythmia, which means an irregular heartbeat that will kill you. So that's the danger there. And that's hydroxychloroquine. 
There are other drugs that have been looked at like ivermectin, which your uh, viewers may know as an antiparasitic. It's used widely in this country for uh, parasites in sheep, et cetera, in Australia and also in India. So it's a common drug, but it has no effect whatsoever. We used it on countless patients. What we also like to use is blood thinning agents because the patients that come in that are quite ill tend to develop micro clots in the lung, in the skin, in the kidneys. And by thinning the blood, we prevent those micro clots from forming. This virus does amazing things. It's a very fastidious virus, but very, un it's, that's why it's called the novel coronavirus. coronavirus. It's very novel. It does things that I've never heard of a virus doing. And it's, by the way, it's giving us a lot of secrets. It's revealing perhaps the causes of some of the diseases that heretofore we have not understood. And that's pretty interesting. And that's very, very valuable information. Yes. So to sum up the answer to your question, we have no definitive drug that will prevent COVID from infecting you and from killing you. But fortunately, the great majority of patients who get infected that don't have diabetes, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease are, are going to do okay. Those in nursing homes that are aged people in their 80s and 90s that have these other conditions run the risk of dying because of these other um, medical conditions that weaken their immune systems. Uh, have, you, have you seen any cases with microclot uh, young patients died or? Yes. Okay. And that's very good that you brought that up because that is exactly what seems to be killing our younger patients. Within the lung itself, <clears throat> in the sac, which we call the alveolus, there are blood vessels, capillaries. Yes. And these capillaries, I'm told that post-mortem, uh, that's a, an autopsy after a patient has died, if you section those tissues, you can see these microclots within the lung itself. And once those microclots form in the capillaries, it prevents air exchange completely. So basically, the part of the lung that is clotted off dies. And microclots are worse than big clots because big, big clots you can see, but the microclots you can't. So that's why almost everyone who comes into the hospital gets blood thinners right off the bat, like heparin, low molecular weight heparin. Yes. So we talked about the uh, testing. We talked about the treatment. Uh, what can you tell our audience regarding the vaccination? Any, any new development in vaccination? Yes. There's, there's all sorts of developments. In fact, it's good you ask that because I have here the whole summary of vaccination, <laughs> different yeah. vaccines. You know, the classical vaccination is getting the antigen, which in this case is the COVID-19, and weakening the virus, culturing it, weakening it, and injecting it like the polio virus vaccine or the measles vaccine or diphtheria, and you name it. And what, that's the old method of doing vaccine. And that's very effective if it works. And uh, there are a number of whole virus vaccines. Those are called whole virus vaccines, W-H-O-L-E. Those vaccines hopefully will not be live vaccines, but rather weakened or what's called an attenuated live virus vaccine. Those vaccines have limitations because you can't inject them into people who are immunosuppressed because people who are immunosuppressed may not mount a response to a whole virus. The other virus vaccines that are very effective are ones that involve new mechanisms, such as messenger RNA. Uh, this virus vaccine is inclusive of the messenger RNA, which is patterned after the RNA in the COVID virus. The RNA in the COVID virus makes DNA. That DNA makes a messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA is the mirror image of the COVID's RNA. And that's injected into a cell uh, either directly uh, or vis-a-vis -vis a, uh, a carrier protein. When that's injected, the body thinks it's been infected with COVID-19 when in fact all it's been infected with is a messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. It's a, it's a mirror image of DNA. And uh, if you took biology in high school, you'll know what DNA and RNA is. So yes. RNA is very effective. The other virus that's uh, used is called the viral vector vaccine. And that is using adenovirus. Adenovirus is a harmless virus. Uh, adenovirus 5 is a carrier. You put pieces 
of the COVID-19 into the adenovirus and you infect the patient with this harmless virus and the cells pick up the antigen and on their surfaces, they express the code, the COVID spike protein. So then immune system comes along and says, oh, you've been infected. And it makes copious neutralizing antibodies when in fact the virus has not infected you. It's an artificial. We're trying to fool the immune system with the virus vaccine. So those are the big ones. I, I'm trying to see if there are any others. No, there's protein-based vaccines, and that's taking the, the COVID protein and injecting the protein itself. I don't know how that is working, but you have viral vector, whole virus, and you have messenger RNA. So those are very exciting, and that has allowed us to go very fast, to quote the President of the United States, Trump, warp speed development of a vaccine. So you want to see this vaccine by December or at the latest January. Once we are all vaccinated against this virus and it's very effective in phase four studies, then we can go back to restaurants and go back to leading our normal lives and not worry about getting infected and dying or getting terribly sick. Yeah. One another uh, question, very uh, curious question uh, comes from a lot of people that what if virus get mutated next year? Do we need a new vaccine just like influenza? Is that is that a possibility that we may have a new virus next year with COVID-19 or COVID uh, and we need a separate or new vaccine? This virus happens to mutate very frequently. And so there have already been 20 or 30 mutations of this COVID-19. However, they have not been harmful and it has not changed its infectivity or the seriousness of the infection. Great. So yes, you're right. Maybe like the influenza, there will be a mutation that will alter the spike proteins. The spike proteins, I wish I had a model of this virus. It has little spikes to get yes. out of it. And those are called the nucleocapsid. Those are proteins to which the immune system makes antibody. And if those proteins change, not significantly, but even subtly, so now the vaccine is not totally specific, it's okay because we'll be able to control it and we'll be able to alter our vaccine to match the mutation. Yes. We do that with the flu very, very frequently. And as you know, every year you have a, if you get vaccinated, you, you can still get the flu, but you'll get a mild case of mild case. It's the same thing with COVID-19. If it mutates and we give you the vaccine and it changes its character, you'll get it, but you won't get it as severely as we're seeing now, where the virus goes unchecked because there's virtually no protection in our immune systems against this virus. Very good, very good, very good information about the, the vaccine. A lot of questions and confusion to a lot of people and you clarified it so well. Uh, any, uh, Dr. Lahita, any uh, departing message for our audience, uh, take home message for our audience, uh, for them yes. well, until the vaccine is available, what should they do? <laughs> well, the vaccine is not going to be available for a while, but we have to take specific care. Now, I was on a program this morning with NBC News and talking about millennials and Generation Z. <laughs> yes. I did not know what Generation Z was, but it's anybody who's five years of age to 20. That's Generation Z. The millennials are 20 to, I guess, 40 or 50. Yes. Maybe up to 50. So these people think they're invincible. And as we know, there are inflammatory syndromes that occur in young people below the age of 20, and they're very serious. Uh, so you've got to be careful and you can't think you're invincible. This is for the young people I'm talking to. I'm addressing them directly. Don't think you're immune to this virus. Be careful because Maybe not everybody's going to get very, very sick, but if it's one of your friends out of, say, 20 of you that has the right immunogenetic character, and that's what's killing people, not everybody has the same immune system, what will happen is your friend will die, and everyone will feel very badly that the virus has infected millennials or Generation Zs. Now, older people, uh, as we get older, our immune systems sort of tamp down and you try to keep your health, try to keep physically active, eat well, take your vitamins or whatever uh, makes you feel like you're doing very well and healthy. Um, as you get older and older, you come specifically at risk because of associated conditions like diabetes, lung disease, hypertension, etc. And that's why the nursing homes were such violent 
you know, vector oriented places where people were infected and the death rate was so high because these patients have very little in the line of protection. So the virus gets in, the immune system of these elderly people goes nuts and we have a lot of deaths. First of all, the nursing homes are now being considered very, very labile sites. So you're protected, you have to wear protective equipment when you go in. Uh, the patients are all encouraged to wear masks. If they won't wear a mask, they will be isolated. So that no longer will this infection go through the nursing home uh, rapidly and kill 40 and 50 people at a time. So the different age groups are important, but the interesting thing that we're seeing now is in Florida and Texas, young people, people below the age of 30 who are getting infected, didn't think they could get infected. You may remember seeing the pictures of them cavorting on the beach, uh, no masks, playing volleyball, laying on a blanket with five or six friends. I saw it in Central Park here in New York. I saw a lot of people in Central Park in the meadow sitting alongside of each other, no protection whatsoever, no mask, no social distancing, and that's a formula for disaster, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. I know people think that they're invincible and they all say to themselves, I'm not going to get this. And then they get it. If you don't protect yourself, you're going to get it. So just be careful. It's only a couple more months. Just try to use your brain and remember, think of everybody around you as being a source of infection and you'll do well. When you come out of the gas station, the restaurant, the men's room or ladies' room, wash your hands. Very important. Keep washing your hands. Soap and water destroys this virus. This virus is very labile to heat, soap, bleach, Purell. Um, <clears throat> and you have to have a certain number of viruses to be successfully infected. So it's got to be a big dose. And, you, you know, it's got to be somebody who spit on you or somebody who's close to you and has, <clears throat> has vaporized. They, they've sneezed on you or coughed on you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lohita, for that wonderful departing message and your entire talk today. I'm so privileged to have you on Matt Talk. You provided wonderful and latest information on COVID-19 and the pandem pandemic of the century. Uh, I am so thankful to you, uh, your time. I know you are very busy with the interviews and your practice and a and, uh, lot of things going on with your busy schedule right now. But I am so thankful to you uh, to coming to Matt Talk and uh, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay, stay healthy and keep serving uh, our population. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shushar. It's a, bit, it's a great privilege to talk to your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.